Hi everybody and welcome to another piano video here at the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. Today we're looking at Kawai's K200. This is a piano that sometimes gets a little overlooked because of this, the sheer dominance of the K300 uh, in the marketplace. But the K200 is not to be skipped or forgotten. There is a lot to like with this little guy. So we're gonna be talking about its sound and its action and, and covering a lot of the tech specs, but also telling you where we think musically this instrument really does excel for its price point. So if you're in that price range, something in the five to $10,000 range, and Kawhi was a brand that was on your list, well, you'll wanna stick around and uh, hear out this discussion. If it's the first time that you have visited us here on YouTube, we would really love if you hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, because uh, we'd love for you to become a regular viewer of the channel. Um, all of your support really helps the channel to grow, uh, for us to continue making uh, great content uh, for people who just love all things piano, and I guess music in a general sense. So without further ado, let's get started with the K200 right away. So the K-series is not really that new. It's 2021 right now. Um, who knows what year you might be watching this in. It might be 2022, 2023, whatever it is. Um, we're into the 2020s. And the K-series arrived uh, in the early 2010s. I think uh, the first one might have made its appearance in 2013 or 2014. It was somewhere in that range uh, where the K3 became the K300 and the K2 became the K200. And the rest is history. You know, it's been a very successful line for Kawhi and gone on to become a much beloved uh, upright piano line the world over. And it occurred to us maybe about a month ago that we had never done a video review of the K200. And at first, that didn't really bother me because in a lot of ways, I think the reason we missed it uh, on the channel might possibly be the reason why the rest of the marketplace hasn't really focused on it nearly as much as the K300 because it kind of falls into a weird pricing size feature place. The value of the instrument doesn't scream quite as loudly as something like the K300. Uh, and that could be because there's less of a prominent um, model in the marketplace to position against. You know, the Yamaha U1 and the K300, it's like the two titans stepping into the ring. Well, what does the K200 go up against? Uh, you know, one might argue that, well, Yamaha's got the B-series, but when you look at the specs on the B-series and compare it to that of the K200, it's not really that apples to apples. Uh, you know, people will have their preference between a U1 and the K300, and certainly there's a lot of technical differences between them, but you can really make the argument that at least you're talking about an equally quality built product, um, and it's just a choice, you know, musically speaking, between the two. But what is the K200 position against? What's, what's its kind of, you know, arch rival out in the, in the marketplace? And there is really not one uh, out there. And so I think for a variety of reasons, the point is that not only have we skipped over it, but maybe the marketplace generally doesn't give the K200 its proper due. And so when we returned back from our recent COVID hiatus, the K200 was one that I really wanted to re-explore, musically speaking. Uh, and understand it, um, not having decided whether we were going to review it and include it on the channel. Well, here we are, so obviously we made the call, uh, and that's because I grew to love the K200 for a variety of reasons. Um, now, it fills an interesting gap in the marketplace because there are a deluge of Chinese-made branded and, I don't know, let's call it semi-branded or lesser-branded uh, options uh, for upright pianos that are going to be in the four or five thousand, maybe six thousand uh, dollar price point, and they're going to give you 48 inch options, 50 inch options, 52 inch options from the likes of Pearl River or any of their uh, affiliated uh, brands, uh, Rip Mueller. Uh, you've got options from, uh, I guess, uh, Hyloon would be in that category. You've got some Brazina options, you've got some. 
uh, Palatino options. Is, I, the list goes on and on. Kingsburg and uh, the rest. Um, but the K200 sits above those, both in terms of price point and definitely in terms of spec. But it's below that uh, sort of um, unspoken golden rule that says that if you're going to buy a serious upright piano, um, that really it's got to be over 48 inches. Uh, or at least there's certainly a segment of the marketplace that believes that to be the case. Um, but this stands on its own. And there are several musical characteristics about this piano uh, that I think make it worth the consideration. Um, and I wouldn't really describe it as the baby brother to the K300. It is so musically different from the K300 that this is almost uh, equal but different rather than the same but lesser. Um, so before I go any further, let's play this K200 and get a sound in our ear and uh, we'll continue on from there. It's a fun piano to play. I was getting a little carried away. I have to admit, this is the first time I've played in front of a real acoustic piano in many, many weeks. Never mind COVID, uh, there's a newborn at home. And so for a whole host of reasons, um, just sitting and jamming out on an instrument, it's been a little bit toughy. So I'm a little bit toughy, a little bit tough. Uh, so thank you for indulging me in coming along on my little Georgia journey there. Uh, so there's, I'm going to walk you through the musical aspects of what I like about this piano. Um, and it's not 100% all good. I mean, no piano is perfect. There's parts of this instrument uh, where I 
um, would like it to be a little bit more of this or a little bit more than that, and I'll tell you those too. But there's certain areas of the instrument where you can really dig in and find some beautiful textures that for the price um, are tough to find and I think depending on your playing style, uh, this could be such a musical partner, a musical little gem without breaking the bank. And you know, that's not always the easiest thing to do. Guitarists spend a lifetime on you know, their journey to find their perfect magical guitar that sits down and, and just does everything they want it to effortlessly. Saxophone players do the same thing. So, uh, and sometimes it's not the most expensive or the most acclaimed instrument that does it for you. We're gonna start with the bass uh, on this instrument. So, um, this is one area where the size of the instrument is uh, working a little bit against it, but they've done a nice job of compensating with the scale design. When you really start hammering these lower octaves, um, there's no distortion, there's no woofiness, there's no uh, sort of uncontrolled harmonics that are coming off this lower section, which is uh, really often um, a behavior that you notice with shorter pianos that aren't absurdly expensive. Um, but the length of the string really prohibits the, the fundamental tone being as prominent as you'd like to. You know, that, that's where a 52 inch or a 50 inch piano really does come in handy, is that you've got that bass string where you have everything you want. You, there's no distortion, there's no weird kind of meow going on. It's a really beautifully made bass string, so there's no uh, kind of odd harmonics happening. And you've got that prominent, nice fundamental. Uh, with the other uh, upper partials built around it. Here, it's a little more upper partially um, than, uh, than ideal, but it's controlled. The second thing of note is that they've done the break, the break, the transition between that three-stringed uh, steel section down into the copper incredibly well. There are pianos twice this price and four inches taller that don't do the break as well as what they've got happening here on the K200. I, it's, well, you can tell because over the course of an octave the, the character changes, but there's no one or two notes where it really sticks out where you don't even have to look. You know exactly where that transition has occurred. It's very smooth, and we haven't done anything crazy with voicing here. I mean, this is factory voicing. <laughs> That's just a gorgeous, smooth transition from uh, that tri-chord area down into your uh, single bass string range. Now you can draw the warmth out of it in the bottom half of the dynamic range, so... So they're there, it's just very easy to overpower that warmth with the upper partials once you start pushing the dynamics. into the tenor section. Mixing, very nicely blended.
up into the midsection, you get a very European character uh, through uh, middle C and the two octaves up from there. Now what do I say when I mean European? I mean, that's just one of those labels that gets thrown around so loosely. Um, but in this case, what I'm talking about is uh, a particular bell-like quality of the attack. Really beautiful sustain happening after that attack. And a, a bit of a prominence on, I think they say it's the third or the fourth partials. That thing that makes it sound a little bit more like a church bell. And this is where the sustain of this instrument really starts to open up, which I would say musically is its crowning achievement. If you are a melody finesse player, particularly if you like writing um, and you're more of a melodic player than kind of a, a chunky, chordy, Harry Connick Jr. kind of thing happening down in the, in the bottom, you are gonna love this piano for what it gives you for the price point. Then up through the treble, it's beautifully complex. There's a really lovely, um, you know, and harmonious uh, balance there. Like you're getting a lot of interesting cabinet resonance out of here. Kind of gives you that shimmer. Shades of like Stravinsky or something up there. Yeah, that is so hard to get on price ranges that the K200 occupies. Honestly, it's. So that's uh, kind of a quick discussion of the profile of sound that this piano gives you. It's not a magic bullet. I mean, you're not going to get a magic bullet piano for six, seven thousand US dollars, you know, or whatever it happens to be in your market. But I mean, that's kind of generally the ballpark uh, of what this instrument is going to uh, sell for, um, you know, uh, and. The delicacy and the complexity that you get simultaneously in the treble is quite special. So now, why does the piano give us the tone that it gives us? Uh, so it's part of the K-series, so there are uh, design elements in this piano that are common throughout the whole K-series. Uh, one of those is the extended key length. That directly doesn't really have to do with any of the tone that we're hearing about. There is an indirect relationship there. So the length and key does a few things. It does extend 
uh, the potential force that you can apply you know, to the key. It's a lever, so uh, the longer you make a lever on either end, the more force you're able to apply. You know, it's just a torque, torquey thing. Um, but the other thing that it does is it reduces the, uh, the change in angle um, as you uh, play into the key. And so it makes it a little easier to control the key as you go in, as you go out. The other thing is a longer key stick on an upright is going to make it feel closer to that of a small grand. So there's going to be less of a disconnect between the playing experience um, between an up this upright action and, say, a smaller grand action. Uh, the second aspect uh, to point out on this instrument is that we've got the carbon fiber action. That's Kawhi's you know, thing uh, that they've been doing for Oh man, I think the first carbon fiber action probably showed up in the early 2000s, if I'm not mistaken. So I mean, years and years and years out uh, in the field, um, lots of reliable use. And of course, the biggest um, unarguable benefit of it is it is a low maintenance action. I mean, all of those parts just aren't really reacting to changes in heat, changes in humidity. Um, from a musical standpoint, where there are some benefits, or people, some people have observed some benefits, is um, uh, an increased repetition speed. So the K200s, or generally the K-series, have just a crazy good repetition speed. I think Kawhi claims to have scientifically captured the fastest repetition speed uh, you know, on record, if there are records for that kind of thing. But... <laughs> it's pretty fast. The hammer on the Millennium 3 action is a mahogany core hammer, which is a little more premium at double felted as well than you would get for this price range. Uh, and two other features about this instrument which really uh, kind of make it stand out a little bit amongst its peers. Tapered solid spruce soundboard. That's just kind of an ordinary thing once you get up over top of the $10,000 mark. Um, but at half that price point, it's quite unusual. Uh, and then finally, what you find generally with Kawhi scale designs is a, a, a bit of uh, overstringing beyond what's normally done. And so you get a slightly longer bass string in there compared to what other instruments have. So the bass string in here is actually the same length as some bass strings in 48 inch pianos. So that's worth noting for people who are really focused on that particular 48 inch number. There, it's, it's not a simple black and white thing. You buy a 48 inch piano, it doesn't automatically mean that all specs that you get associated with any 48 inch is going to match one where you've had a benchmark uh, recommended uh, by a friend or, or a colleague. So a number of things contributing uh, to the sounds that we're hearing, but I think what most people really care about is the end result, the music, the tone that you're getting. Um, and for me, that's where this piano really comes together, is in the top half of this instrument. The bottom half is well done, it's well executed, and it gives you uh, sort of a standard, usable, functional um, bass range to the piano. There's nothing really to complain about. But I also wouldn't say that there's anything that you know melts your heart about the bottom of this instrument. The top of this instrument, however, would honestly have fooled me uh, into thinking I was behind a really well-made European piano of 47, 48, 49 inches. Maybe not 49, 47 or 48 inches for sure. The shimmer, the sustain, the complexity of the, of the treble is really just beautiful. So for people who are in the market and they're thinking about, let's say, a used piano in the 48 inch range, or maybe they can stretch up a couple thousand, but they know for sure they're not into the Japanese 48 inch new market, which would kind of be your K300 U1. I would not skip over the K200. I would absolutely make sure that you give this piano a play. I think it's going to wind up delivering a phenomenal uh, punch for its price, especially when you compare it to something like anything from the Yamaha B series or possibly even uh, some of the Essex or the new Samic built uh, Bostons. Um, any of those instruments, I think the K200 is just going to stand on its own and really deliver something quite special and possibly unexpected as it was for me. Thank you so much for watching another of our reviews here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. My name is Stu Harrison. And if it's the first time that you have come across our channel and you enjoyed what you saw, we would really love for you to subscribe because we would love to hear from you again. 
uh, we'd love to have you back as a viewer again uh, because it's a fun uh, global piano adventure that we've been on for a couple of years now um, and I can't tell you how satisfying and enjoyable it has been for all of us to share what we know about pianos with all of you. So have yourselves a great day and we will see you for another video soon.